Yeah. Okay. Hey. Welcome. Uh, today, I'm Aaron Sanders. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to learn faster and how Scrum has this compatibility with uh, with things like Lean UX, Lean Startup, Design Thinking, and other discovery elements. Are really what this is known as, as well as dual track Scrum, uh, a term that Marty Kagan, Jeff Patton, and others use quite a bit. It was started way back when uh, with Desiree C. She worked at a company that was acquired by Autodesk, and at that time, Autodesk was very waterfall. The company that she worked with was using Scrum, so she wrote a paper to describe how they were using uh, both design and delivery inside the same sprint. So there's this uh, track of development alongside this track of interaction design. So designers are really working kind of at a sprint N minus one level, feeding that design into sprint N uh, that would implement those designs and those that kind of feeds forward into what gets tested in the next cycle. So in one cycle, where both coding what happened in the sprint before and doing some design testing for what's about to happen next. So here is the Scrum framework I want to quickly walk through. But show of hands, how many people know Scrum? Excellent. Uh, keep your hands up if you're using Scrum. Keep your hands up if you are developers on a Scrum team. OK. And are shipping code, potentially ship shippable code, at the end of every sprint. All right. And talk to users every sprint. All right. A couple of hands went up in that last one. So maybe a couple of opportunities for those using Scrum. First, and a lot of our talks have, have focused on this. I've noticed different speakers of really shipping code, always be shipping. So that's probably the first opportunity for us. And then the second one that I would like to, to uh, invite you to consider is how to get in touch with and talk to your users every single sprint. So I won't spend much time here uh, with, with the, the uh, Scrum framework, right? We have a product owner, owns this product backlog triangle shape because things down at the bottom here can be big and vague. They don't need to be so detailed out. And then we work with the team here to refine the backlog ahead of the sprint, which of course makes that planning meeting so much, much better. And that's really why we've extracted away this backlog refinement is as a pre-planning event, make sure the top of that backlog is really airtight. Then we have a sprint. Each sprint is the same length. Different organizations use different lengths. It seems these days the typical length is two weeks, but somewhere between one and four. It was very radical when Scrum started to ship product every single month, and that's what they tried to do. Now, of course, it's radical to ship product every 10 or 11 seconds, which is where places like Amazon.com and Etsy and others in the continuous delivery model are getting into. So at the end, of course, we want to create these, right? This potentially shippable product, or WTFs, working tested features, of course, is what WTF stands for. Review retrospect, and then we go back. People don't know what they want until they see it. So as we check out, check out these working tested features, it feeds back into the shape of our product backlog and how we're prioritizing that feeds forward into what we're building. So that is all what I would consider the delivery cycle of Scrum. With dual track then, if I zoom out just a little bit, we're going to add over here to our product owner uh, some people from the team now have to do some double duty. We have a developer and a UXer that are part of this cross-functional team also working with our product owner to think through what do we need to learn? What do we need to discover? Make sure that not only are we building the product right, but we're also building the right product. So there are some things then that we can add on, embellish our Scrum framework with these discovery items. And uh, we have things instead of a static roadmap more of this opportunity backlog. So trying to add dynamism right up to the front with, with uh, how we approach these ideas, these 
uh, identifying pains of our users and applying remedies, keeping that very dynamic, doing some user research, building up story maps, ideating through design studios, per sketching personas, doing user validation on right fidelity prototypes. So Bill Buxton, he's a UX author, he says there's no such thing as right and oh, I'm sorry, there's no such thing as high and low fidelity, only right and wrong fidelity, depending on what you're trying to learn. We try to measure if we're building the right product with these key performance indicators, KPIs, also known as OKRs, objectives and key results. So people, once again, don't know what they want until they see it. So as people are, are working with these different prototypes and as we're learning from them what's important, that feeds back into this opportunity backlog. Now with different companies that I've worked with, go back to them and, and ask how many of these opportunities actually move forward into a sprint or onto a product backlog? Any guesses? What percentage of work actually moves from opportunity to product backlog? All of them? Not much. <laughs> so from many to a few. Yeah, usually less than 50%. So a really high amount would be around 40%. So that's really why we want to think about, instead of having this static year-long roadmap that usually drains out over the year, and then at the end of the year we fill it back up for the next year, is trying to keep this really dynamic. And as we learn something doesn't have user value, how to shift, how to pivot away from those items into those that we think do have much more value. So when we create this, this, this cohort, this collaborative balance team up here, is really we're looking at answering three different questions with discovery. So we want to find the middle of this intersection of what is valuable, what do people want, uh, what is usable, do they really love this experience, and then what is feasible. Can we really reasonably build the solution given the people and the time that we have? So valuable for me is really this thing of what do people want to buy or use? And so we don't go out and ask them directly, hey, well, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely would you be to use this feature? If they're in a grouchy mood, they'll say one, I don't wanna use it. And if they're in a really happy mood and they wanna please you, they'll say, oh, I don't know, like an eight or a nine. There's usually not really a lot in the middle, right? We're asking them to speculate. So we don't ask these questions directly. We usually find some oblique ways to find these answers. People want it because they use it. So it's valuable if people are engaging with the solution. Now sometimes the experience gets in the way of that. I was at a place that has a uh, movie festival and you can buy these tickets. But when I went there, the movie festival was sold out, yet independent movies were still available. So they had an application that you could download and find which movies were still, still had tickets available. Sadly, it was listed in alphabetical order. And then if the movie was sold out, strike through, through the text. So I'd have to scroll until I found a movie title that did not have strike through, and then it would say playing Tuesday. Well, this is Wednesday, that does me no good. Scroll, find another one. Oh, that's playing Friday, does me no good. So I abandoned that app. It was something I really wanted. I, had, I needed that information. I thought that was valuable for me, but the experience itself got in the way, so I abandoned the application. Creating this cross-functional team of product discovery or product ownership, we really need to think about then how to collaborate. I find this is one of the weak points in Scrum, right? We have this, what's sometimes called the single ringable neck of the product owner to eliminate competing priorities. And it starts to maybe strike of being anti-collaborative, of not being so cross-functional. We get one person from the business and their opinion matters most. So we're trying to assemble a team now that can really think through these problems. And they have to know when to stand forward and when to stand back, right? Our product owner really knows the park at what people would find valuable. User experience here and dev over here. So one way to make this work comes out of uh, the fifth 
discipline guidebook. And uh, it really talks about the time and the skill that we have available for work. So if, if we're low skilled in leadership and don't have a lot of time, we tend to tell people what to do, or sometimes we yell at people what to do. A little higher up, we sell people on what to do, or we test, or we, we consult and collaborate. And at the very top, we co-create. Now, Senge says the only way to get into consulting, collaborating, and co-creating is through mutual purpose. So really understanding together what makes something valuable, usable, and feasible. And that uh, stance then, really collaboration, and it, next door is the dark arts on collaboration, is really sharing an experience. It's messy. It takes a lot of time. We need to see some divergence. We need to hear about the conflict and the diversity of opinions. Why? To share an experience, let go of our personal agenda, and really start to share an understanding and gain that mutual purpose together. So if we don't, for instance, if we just get together, meet, talk through, and sign off on requirements, we might unfortunately have a different picture in mind. So if we find some way to visualize that, which I also find is a large part of collaboration, we can see those differences in opinion. We can talk about it, manipulate that visual model, and since we all bring different ideas and perspectives in, we wind up with a much more sophisticated picture than we leave with that same picture in mind. And so that collaboration shares that experience so we can have that shared understanding, that mutual purpose. When we start with this opportunity backlog, we can start to model out our opportunities. This is a derivative of the lean model canvas, which is, of course, a derivative of the business model canvas. It's somewhat of a paint-by-numbers approach. Uh, in the middle here, at zero position, leap of faith assumptions. What would cause unrecoverable failure if true? Now, really, it's hard to start there. So we tend to start here in the solution idea and the problem space. Now, they're both in the number one position because even when asking people to say, hey, can you, can you help me? see what is the user problem, help describe that, detail it out, they tell me about the solution. So we have to tease apart then that solution from the problem. So we tend to go back and forth really quick. They're very tangled up, try to tease apart that solution, what problem is it really solving. Once we get through that, then we talk about users and choosers. Who's affected by that solution? Who really has the problem? Now sometimes we have both an end user, but we have to get past the chooser first. So I'll give you an example. Motorola Mobility that I worked with, one of their choosers, one of their customers, would be something like Verizon, one of the carriers. Once they sign the contract with the carrier, then they get access to the end users, those consumers. So difference between the chooser and the user. We need to think through both when we're coming up with these opportunities. Now they usually have some way that they work today somehow they get to this goal. Well, usually these solutions aren't so new and novel and innovative. We've never seen them in the world before. So how do they do that today? Which should lead right back into these leap of faith assumptions. So working with a hotel chain, the CEO spun up a scrum team and said, look, our, our members are getting older. We're not gaining new members. We need to attract millennials. They seem to really like their mobile phone and the apps on it. Tell you what, let's build an app for these people, a check-in, check-out app. And we were thinking through different leap of faith assumptions. We knew the user value would be, well, they wouldn't have to stand in line anymore for check-in, right? They could just immediately go to their room if they have this application to check-in. So a user metric would be less people in front of the desk, less time taken. So we did a lightweight amount of user research. We basically went to the front desk of a, of a hotel and watched people check in. And they had that V8 moment. They're like, oh, there's that, there's that assumption. App's not worth building. Any, any guess here? I had you guess on the opportunity. Any guess what the assumption was? Why do you go to the front desk of a, of a hotel? That's it. So what, how could we have an application replace the necessity to gain a key 
from the front desk. So that made this whole thing invalid. Of course, the CEO said, yeah, that's cool, keep going. He went to the board, got some more money, and they, you know, you have these keys that you can now touch to the lock that opens the door. So they figured out how to put that into the application and to go through a bunch of different properties to re-key the whole thing. So you had to add a couple of zeros to this opportunity to make it valid now. All right. So once we really have that opportunity down and we share an understanding, we're literally on the same page of the idea of what to build and what problem it solves, who's it for, and how do we measure it, we can start to do some user research. So I gave you an example of that, of going and watching people at the front desk. Here's another one from a company called the Weather Channel. So they're going out, and you might notice they just have paper in front of them. They don't even have a prototype. They have nothing except for questions. They're trying to find out from, from this subject what's important to him about knowing if the weather is right. right? This was a big question. I I'm a, don't know if you know this from my laptop, I'm a skier. I live in Colorado. If you ask me what's great weather, I'm going to say two feet of snow and just blizzard everywhere. Love it. Let's go. Right? That might not be the kind of weather you think is good. So they're interviewing people to find out where is their critical mass? What do people consider great weather for being outdoors? After we do some user research or alongside of it, we can start to build a story map. This is from Jeff Patton. If you haven't read his user story map book yet, I totally recommend it. It's really a, a a model that we lean on from user-centered design and user experience. So if you know journey mapping or experience mapping, it's that same sort of thing. Now we're applying it to user stories. So we can understand what's important to the user and start to journey map that out, start to map that out. And instead of having this one-dimensional product backlog, we add an extra dimension to it. So going across the map, across this way, is the workflow of how to work through it. Going this way are alternatives or different levels of necessity in each column. Now this is a story map from a medical uh, company and they build a robot. And this robot is in a cage with this, this person, Alex, the packaging tech. And so Alex is managing this robot to put large bottles of of medicine into small boxes, putting them up on shelves to ship off into the pharmacy. So the company built this, this story map and it keeps going a long way. And they asked me, what do you think about this? And I said, well, first off, tell me, what, what, are, what are the different colors and what are these marks? Well, yellow are the tasks, uh, red are problems, blue are questions, and this is actually green are ideas. And I, I said, okay, well with that, what I see is it's a long workflow. Alex has to do a lot to manage this robot. And it seems like starting it up is a bit of a headache. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So they collaborated and built this visual model and shared an understanding about maybe where to focus in on building prototypes or improving their product. The story maps, we can map out our current product. So if you're doing something like a Salesforce integration, is how do all of your systems work now? We can dump that out, spray that up on a wall and see that, and then think about how are we gonna change that later? What is Salesforce going to do for us? So we can use color to talk about things we might need to add with Salesforce or some sort of color or shape to uh, show what we're going to take away from these different systems for an integration like that. With story mappings, then we, of course, sketch personas. We're really trying to be in touch with our user here. And we can do a design studio. So this is, once again, back to the Weather Channel. And all of this stuff, even though we're trying to create a product owner team, is meant to be highly collaborative. This is a whole team approach. So we have people leading on and helping us figure out what we need to do to find these answers. Then as a team, we, we find these answers together. So in this design studio, they're thinking through a new uh, hurricane tracker, right? Some sort of place where we can go and see when the weather is really bad. And so here's a front-end developer next to the UXer. 
next to a QA person, next to a developer. And off, off the picture, there's also the product manager. And even the scrum master is sketching on this. A fast sketch for about 15 minutes, share those results with each other, then use that information for another round of sketching. They would do this about three or four times. So remember collaboration, we, we diverge to converge. So in the first round of the design studio, highly divergent, right? Another great thing about collaboration is start independently. So we made sure we had enough information that each person could sketch, but not so much information that we're biasing each other. So each person could lay down their thoughts and ideas. And then after everybody did that, we would collectively share out. And then we saw a couple of rounds of divergence, then we started to see that convergence. And when they really came close together, then we thought, okay, here's an idea to prototype. Now, not all the time through design studios do these ideas combine so nicely, and that's okay. Remember, one of the lean principles is deliver fast, decide late. So if these ideas are not completely compatible, how do we take both out? and figure out how to test these ideas for our users and have them help us decide what's most important. One of the best wins that we had at the Weather Channel was going from the stakeholders saying, I think, to them saying, users say, and using empirical evidence of what they were gaining from the market to help figure out how to make solutions, and really leaning on the team to find the answers from those users of what the problems were and the right solutions to apply. So this is the team figuring out what's important in this hurricane tracker, not it being handed down from some stakeholder from above. These uh, design studios run a lot better if we can figure out some way to stretch past what is probable and into what is possible. So a prompt that I'll use for this is, what would you make if you didn't have to make it work? And I uh, gratuitously stole it from uh, this, this uh, post right here. And Uni, I can't remember her last name, but Uni came up with this. So I, I asked people to include technology that doesn't exist in this world today. It can exist in a different world or in the future or parallel universe, but something we can't actually make today to try to get past this, this probable into even the impossible and then snap back into a preferable kind of solution, not just the mediocre status quo solution. Uh, a lot of people talk about minimum viable products. Here's a pro tip for you. If you want to make that viable product smaller, more minimum, figure out ways to minimize your market first. So it really means a lot of interactions with the users to figure out who do we super serve. Probably, going back to weather again, not me as a skier for great weather, maybe more the golfer that for, for the good weather. So we really want to think about the user that's most affected by the solution and the problem they have. So try to figure out ways to minimize that market for that first release, and every release for that matter after that. So with all of that, we can do some user validation with right fidelity prototypes. Uh, what we, with Weather Channel is pretty easy because we could go out into coffee shops and do coffee shop testing, right? Consumers are all over the place, are, are affected by the weather. But really, we need to go to wherever the product is used. So if it's an internal IT app, go to those people that use it. If it's a Salesforce integration, let's talk to sales about, that, about what they need, right? So, but instead of bringing them to you, you go to them. Watch them in action, see how they use your product, see what they're doing. They'll just do things regularly and routinely, and you're keeping in the back of your mind, wow, that's a really crazy workaround they're doing. We should, should really focus on how to solve that problem for them. However, here are, are all prototypes that got tested with the market. So even here, this whiteboard is a prototype. So this was the right fidelity for them to test in the beginning. Why? They sold a multi-million dollar contract across network and web and apps uh, to show the weather on your route to the airport. It was called a business traveler app. And immediately in testing this in just the whiteboard, they found out, 
people don't really care about the weather to the airport. There's other apps that take care of that. They know to add more time if the weather is bad to get to the airport. What mattered more is people that commute more than 10 miles, I guess that's like 16 kilometers, to work. And if the weather is changing on them on their way to be able to find an alternate route to work. So this was the right level of prototype to find that out. Once they got there, they could move in to more of a basalmic look and dial it in, dial it in to a clickable prototype with animation. And then finally, even this is a prototype that takes barely any work to push into the uh, app store. Also, somewhere in here too, is you can really start to certify with Apple the application pre-release and even make it easier for you to get that certification for that app release. Key performance indicators, there's all sorts of them. I'll tell you, one of them that they had when I walked in there was unique views. Unique views was very important. However, what are you doing? That's a vanity metric. What are you doing, Weather Channel, to affect UVs? Well, really nothing. Because when the weather is bad, UVs go up. So we, uh, we try to think about the kinds of indicators that we actually have control over. And here's another pro tip. Think about the kinds of indicators that will maximize outcome and impact. So if we start with the world as it is now, and we think about people with different, uh, you know, they're sad, have some pains, or maybe they're confused or downright angry, we come up with some sort of idea we call it a product, a feature, specification, or this is kind of a dirty word with Agile, requirement, right? Required means just be quiet, get out of here, read the manual, why are you talking to me? But remember, we want to collaborate. We want to try to get to a shared understanding of what to do. Once we have that shared understanding of the right idea, we start to build it and deliver it into the world later. Now, many people will me measure this delivery as success. But once again, if people aren't using it, how is that successful? So we really want to think about, is anybody happy now? Have we changed an emotional state? Have we changed user behavior? Are they, are they saying, this makes my job so much easier? I love this. I totally know when to golf now, whatever else. Now, be warned, there might be some people that are still ambivalent or angry, but you might notice they're outside of that, that design target for that specific release. The trick is not to build software. The trick is to figure out how to maximize the outcome, how to change your user behavior as quickly as possible, which actually means minimizing the output. So the biggest return on the smallest investment, very infinitesimal amount of investment to lay down some squiggly marks on a whiteboard and put that in front of people and say, hey, does this help you get to the airport better? And they say, why do I care about that? Right? Without building any code at all is figuring out what's the important outcome for people. It's figuring out if the weather's bad on my way to work when I have a long commute. All of this stuff, all this Scrum stuff comes from this thing called the new, new product development game. Now new is doubled up because it's really a new game for new product development. Now the old game is called a relay race, right? We do all of phase one, take a break, do all of phase two. Uh, some places overlap their phases a little bit. Uh, Jeff Sutherland, one of the co-creators of Scrum, calls Scrum type C process, all phases at once. That's why it's called Scrum. It's a rugby approach, not a relay race handing off, but a multidisciplinary hand-picked team that works together from start to finish. I say that because not all, only are we talking about phases at once, like design, develop, and test, but also these phases of discovery and delivery. How can we do both in a continuous fashion on our Scrum team? So discovery really is a design thinking process. We're gaining empathy with our users by talking to them. We usually have some sort of framing for a problem, like commuter weather app. But as we talk to people, that problem widens out. So we need to narrow in and redefine the problem somehow with some sort of thing like a design studio. Then we start to flare out again as we ideate and come up with solutions that we prototype test and figure out which one or two of those prototypes to really bring forward into the world. From there, 
let's look at this idea of discovery and delivery then. Like I was saying, they should really be continuous. As we discover, we deliver. And as we deliver, we discover. Now, really, that's building and learning side by side. So that sounds a lot like this uh, lean startup idea of building code, measuring data, and learning ideas to build. Now, Eric Ries called that lean part of lean startup for cycle time. He would talk about going through this cycle in the order of 50 times a day. Right? So really trying to decouple the learning from the delivery, learning very fast, going out and getting in touch with your market frequently, several times a day, if not several times a week. So now if I zoom out, it gives you kind of this whole picture then of the dual track, discovery and delivery. Another tip here is in this sprint planning meeting is start to talk about what do we need to build? What do we need to learn? Do we need to talk to users? Do we need to update our story map? Should we do a design studio? Do we need to create a prototype? So we start to add those things in during sprint planning and get them on the sprint backlog. So once again, Weather Channel, I talk about them because they let me. Uh, we would then say uh, Friday, every Friday we would talk to users. So one hour times seven people, a task, talk to users, seven hours, and just put that on the sprint backlog so that we would make sure to commit to both the discovery and the delivery side. Then at the daily stand-up, we basically go around the, the circle twice. First time, what are we building? What's getting in our way of getting things done and built? Then what are we learning? And what's getting in the way of what we need to learn? And in between, sometimes some people would say, you know what, I'm not going to really be on the discovery side so today, so I'm going to go back to work you continue with that stand-up. Then at the end of the, of the sprint at review, not only are we looking at these WTFs, the working tested features, but we can start to look at the artifacts of what we've been learning. We can look at these prototypes. IDEO says, if a picture is worth a thousand words, prototype is worth a thousand meetings. Kind of goes back to what Dave was talking about this morning. Instead of writing all of these things down on cards and user stories and pumping them into your tool, is figure out ways to talk to your users, have them narrate that product story, and figure out ways to illustrate that story via prototype and in different visual methods. They're a lot richer than just something as a user, I want to sew that written on a card. Well, I guess that's about it. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, this link here actually goes to a Dropbox where there's all sorts of materials, uh, resources, method papers on how to do things like run a design studio or do story mapping. And then as you uh, start to really kick butt with this stuff, I'd love to know. So, so drop me an email or give me a text message. Let me know how things are going with all of this stuff. And with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes, in the front, we have a microphone for you, so you have to pause for a second. Um, just a question, because you started about those KPIs, you are often using the Weather Channel example, so other than user views, what KPIs did you come out with, which would actually check on happy users? Yeah, uh, a great question, and I can't really disclose that. But uh, UVs are like, oh, we can't do anything to increase them. We need to come up with a different KPI. I will say that instead of five KPIs, they came up with one. And that one was measured across all of digital. So product, development, QA, everybody had the same one measure. It's a pity you can't disclose it. Pardon? I can't <laughs> disclose it, though. I'm sorry. Uh, back over here. Hi. Uh, I have one question. Just now you mentioned about the user uh, research using the papers. I, I believe it's some type of uh, paper uh, role play and uh, prototyping. Uh, that is uh, usually work well for the commercial product. Uh, no, 
uh, consumer product. That means uh, if you want to know how is the customer's response. But I just recall some of the you know the system used in the you know the uh, enterprise solutions like logistics or something, or even uh, ERP. There are a lot of uh, workflows and the tons of alternatives. Uh, how, how how do you deal with this type of uh, complicated system? Because I, I think even in the industry, people have thoughts about how agile can apply well for the you know the enterprise solutions or complicated systems. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, part of user research is doing both qualitative and quantitative research. So the qualitative is usually low in numbers of people we talk to, but high in that subjective quality where we figure out why people are doing what they're doing. The quantitative, very high in numbers and high in numbers of people, right? So the instrumentation that we have inside the product and any analytics, so we can figure things out like that. And even with this consumer app, uh, one thing that they saw is when they talk to people, everybody says, I love the map. I love seeing how the weather moves over the map. But then quantitatively, when we looked at the analytics, nobody's clicking on the map area. So it told us what, right? It told us that, that, that uh, people were not clicking there, but it didn't tell us why. And as we tried to figure out why, they told us, oh, I love the map. Uh, through some twists and turns, we learned that uh, uh, people more associated map with something like Google, and they associated radar with weather. So just a switch of the term from map to radar increased the usage in that area by 20%. But even with, and I would say with these big solutions, ERP solutions, internal, uh, users are much more friendly, right? It's easier usually to find a qualified user and they're more willing to talk to you because they know you as a colleague. So being able to get in touch and talking with them usually is actually easier with these internal applications and usually easier to have that quantified uh, instrumentation that we can, the analytics we can look at as well. So both of those are user research. Looking for other hands, uh, any other questions? Yes. You have to yell louder, wait. <laughs> there it is. Okay, um, so I'm currently, we're currently trying to do something which is more or less similar, or at least I can recognize certain things. Yep. Um, do you have any, maybe any ideas of good team sizing, especially on the UX part? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. You know, overall we have this seven plus minus magic number really for communication channels, right? With seven people, we have, we're tracking kind of 21 open channels. So if, if we have you know, 21 people, we have 210 open channels. So that's probably too big. That's why we use this, this magic number. So uh, for instance, at Motorola Mobility, we had one product owner, but we actually had two UXers. So there was a visual designer alongside an information architect. And then a user researcher was more consultative. She would come into different teams over time. But we actually had two people from UX on, on each Scrum team. Um, and then there was anywhere from five to eight between developers and QA. No Scrum Masters, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, got a question back over here. Yeah, it's a pass the mic. We're ke ke keeping our volunteer busy here. It's getting good exercise. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I heard it, that, but you say you put two, peop two UX people for each Scrum team? For each Scrum team. So how many UX people you have? Millions. No, there was, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was uh, I think overall at Motorola, there was nine or 10 scrum teams. So we're talking about out of customer experience, which in Motorola Mobility was hundreds, we had, I think, a dozen from UX that were embedded full time on these scrum teams. Okay, uh, in my reality, 
which is doesn't have many UX uh, expert yet. So we usually have zero to one UX expert. How would you recommend how we do this? Well, so Kagan says uh, you can have one UXer on two teams or half half a UXer on a team, but in that case, I'm going to want this half. Yeah. <laughs> You know, part of it is context switching, right? If I have to be on two different teams doing two very dissimilar things, uh, I, I've seen research that shows like they've done, done MRI analysis, your brain literally atrophies and you have the cognitive ability of an eight-year-old. So switching around, we turn everybody into primary students, right? So that's one reason to focus. Of course, we don't always have that luxury. Uh, with, the, with the user researcher, right, there was one of her for these 10 or 11 teams. I forget exactly how many now. So she didn't apply her time to any one of them. She had office hours for these different teams, and they would leverage her as necessary to then upskill that user research ability on these teams. So maybe if we don't have enough UXers, it's about upskilling and helping the rest of the team gain some um, amount of ability to take care of, of, of the experience of the product. Thank you. Well, looks like uh, we are out of time. So thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it. See ya.